Good evening, and thank you for joining us. My name is Dr. Maribel Hernandez. I am a cardiologist at the Lankano Heart Institute and also the director of the Women's Heart Initiative. The Women's Heart Initiative is a program which was created to encourage women to learn the truth about heart disease and the risks it poses and to use that knowledge in order to make the best decisions and to be your own advocate for your healthcare in order to make the best and to get the best and equal treatment and to live healthier lives. We're here tonight to discuss an important heart health topic, obstructive sleep, how sleep apnea can affect a woman's heart health. Obstructive sleep apnea is associated with an increase and in progression of coronary artery disease, heart failure, stroke, and development of arrhythmias such as atrial fibrillation in both men and women. However, there are sex specific differences in symptoms and clinical presentations and outcomes between men and women. Obstructive sleep apnea is underdiagnosed in the general population, but is specific, specifically underdiagnosed in women. I want to introduce two mainland health physicians who are our panelists this evening. Dr. Rochelle Goldberg, she is the Section Chief of Sleep Disorders in the Department of Medicine and Medical Director, Paoli Hospital Sleep Medicine Disorders. Dr. John M. Clark is a medical director of cardiovascular genetics and risk assessment program at Lankano Heart Institute. He's a cardiologist with also specialty in heart failure and pulmonary hypertension at Lankano Medical Center. And now I will introduce you Dr. Goldberg. Hello everyone, I'm sharing my screen now so we can get started talking about one of my favorite topics, which is sleep apnea and how it affects women and what that means to heart disease in women. Let's see if we're here. So I wanna just give you a framework for how we'll approach this so you have an idea where we're heading. And uh, we're gonna have a uh, organized kind of in what you want to know, what you need to know, and then what to do about it. So we'll talk about symptoms and features of sleep apnea and why a person might develop sleep apnea, and then what the risks are, the medical risks associated with the condition. When we have a framework for that, we can then look at, well, how do we figure this out? Do I have it? Do I not have it? And if I do, what are my treatment options? So sleep apnea in general, if you see the abbreviation OSA, we are talking about the most common kind of sleep apnea, which is obstructive sleep apnea. And uh, the word apnea comes from the Latin for, oh, sorry, Greek. It comes from the Greek for lack of breath. So it's an interruption or a stop in breathing. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. The uh, overall frequency that we find for men with diagnosed with sleep apnea is about 13% of the general population. For women, it's about 6%. Now I have to qualify that by our understanding that the vast majority of people with sleep apnea are still undiagnosed, which also means they're not treated. And that of course is one of our main concerns in bringing this information to you today. So let's talk about symptoms. Uh, snoring and interrupted breathing are probably the two most commonly discussed symptoms of sleep apnea. Uh, most of the time though, these are symptoms brought to the actual person by a witness, a bed partner, someone who notices that they're doing that. Most people are not aware of their own snoring or with any choking or gasping. And on the other hand, they may well be aware of daytime sleepiness Frequent bathroom trips are another fairly common symptom of sleep apnea. 
And then some other symptoms that are a bit more unusual, but are also more likely to be the presenting features for women with sleep apnea. Morning headaches, uh, feeling more of that, I don't sleep well, trouble staying asleep, my sleep is non-restorative, loosely called insomnia, and depression. So again, a woman may not present with the typical sleepiness symptom, but may have more of these other features. So we already know that uh, this is a more common condition in men than in women, but for both genders, age, increasing age increases the potential for developing sleep apnea. And particularly for women after menopause, there is a definite uptick in the risk for developing sleep apnea. Excess weight can play a role for both genders. Genetics, of course, is another possibility. Uh, these are conditions that can run in families. And those people who have other associated medical conditions like hypertension, heart disease, and diabetes, just having that personal medical history can increase the likelihood that that person, that you, might have sleep apnea. And if we look at the population of people in a hypertension clinic or in a diabetic clinic or other heart disease clinics, those numbers that we talked about before, the 13% and 6%, those numbers can be much higher. They can be 50% of someone in a diabetes clinic or in a hypertension clinic, especially if there's overweight. So how, uh, how does this happen? Why, do we have, why would a person have sleep apnea? So I don't wanna scare you, but I'll tell you that everybody in normal sleep at night has some interrupted breathing or you know, just about everybody. And this happens because of a normal change in breathing while we sleep. We relax, normal sleep, relax, low tone, low demand is the way the body heals itself in sleep. So just like if you're reading a book and you start to fall asleep, you're going to drop, you know, the book will drop. If you are relaxing the rest of your body and the upper airway, then the upper airway muscles that make up that path will relax. And as a result, the path itself gets a little more narrow and a little floppy as part of sleep. If you don't have snoring or sleep apnea, there's still room for the air to flow through properly. But when this narrowing or collapsibility increases or becomes higher than that of the rest of the folks, that's how you might be aware of or told about snoring because the air is still trying to get through. The brain is saying, take the breath. The muscles of the chest and belly are trying to get that air in, but the path is more narrow. The air will pass through and be more turbulent, making the air path vibrate. That's how you snore. Now, if you take that another step or 10, more floppy, more turbulence of the air, it's basically then just circling on itself. It doesn't move through. We don't deliver that breath, which means we also don't deliver the oxygen that we need each breath to provide. So what we see in that event itself, that interrupted breathing, is the person will have an increase in their blood pressure, they'll have an increase in their heart rate with those reduced oxygen levels. And as you can imagine, this is the opposite of what sleep is supposed to be. Low blood pressure, slowed heart rate, along with the other rest and recovery of the body. The brain responds to these signals by causing an arousal, because if you move back toward wake, you get the tone back in the air path, you breathe again. So that's our safety net, that's our built-in protection, that as you might imagine, this still causes a lot of an arousal response, a stress response in the body. And we see that people with untreated sleep apnea will have increased markers for inflammation in the body just as part of this response. So the, but remember, not everybody has the sleep apnea, you have to have at least five times an hour that you're having these breathing interruptions. So remember I told you everybody has some apnea events, but you don't have the apnea condition until these events are frequent enough that we identify it as the sleep apnea condition. 
And that would be with at least five times an hour of the interrupted breathing. I'll talk about that in another minute when we talk about the testing. So the risks for sleep apnea do include male gender, older age, excess weight. And the reason that's in red is because you do not have to be overweight to have sleep apnea. And this is another place where women often are unrecognized or not accepted as possibly having sleep apnea because if they're not obese, then it's thought that they shouldn't have sleep apnea. You do not have to have extra weight because a lot of it is based on the internal way that your air path is taking up space. And if you have the right collapsibility in the tone or a narrowing of the airway anyway, you can still have greater interruptions in breathing during sleep. Jaw position and size can make a difference in the space of the airway. A thick neck can encroach on the, the uh, airway. And then there's some lifestyle things like alcohol, smoking, uh, medications or drugs, especially things that are sedating or for pain because they relax the muscles more. And in sleep, they prevent us from having as quick a response to the interrupted breath. So all of this sounds like it's not very good sleep, it's not very restful, and why on earth would anybody want to be doing this? Of course, it's a change behind the scenes. It's while we're sleeping. So the symptoms we talked about before are part of the reason that we want to treat this condition. Person walking around all day feeling sleepy, they're not going to feel as productive, they can be a little more cranky. Uh, they may be aware that their sleep is disturbed, the headaches I mentioned, and mood, irritability, focus, concentration, processing, all of those things can be impacted in a person with sleep apnea. And one of the sneaky parts to this is that because you don't go from having some normal interrupted breaths at night to suddenly having multiple, multiple times an hour of the interrupted breaths. So we don't really recognize the changes that this has on us. We assume, I slept this way last night, I slept this way last week or last month. It's probably the same, but this is the development of sleep apnea. So the other reason to treat if a person does or doesn't have symptoms would be the medical risks. Because when you do have more moderate to severe sleep apnea, there are increased medical risks, even if the person says that they think they sleep fine, they feel fine. And these are important and risks that we talk about with frequency, uh, high blood pressure, developing high blood pressure, or if you have high blood pressure, making it more of a challenge for the blood pressure to respond to the regimen that your other physicians are trying to use for you. Uh, people can have an increased risk for heart failure, uh, where the pump isn't working as well, and I'm sure Dr. Clark will bring that up, as well as the risk for heart attack and heart rhythm problems, irregular heartbeat, uh, extra beats, and atrial fibrillation. Again, you'll hear more about that from Dr. Clark. Increased uh, blood sugar problems with full-out diabetes mellitus have also been noted and stroke. So again, we're trying to reduce those risks by treating sleep apnea. And if the person already has these conditions, we're trying to get the sleep apnea out of the way so they can respond better to their other treatment options and, and availability. So now figuring out that the person has sleep apnea and how to guide them for you to make your own decisions about what does this mean for me is going to come from testing. The, the sleep testing is done because there's a suspicion for the condition to give us confirmation of the diagnosis and to put in a severity that I mentioned earlier. So the old fashioned way, so to speak, and still commonly done in the right person is the in-lab overnight test, which involves quite a few wires and sensors and is an unusual environment because you're not sleeping in your home. But um, most people actually sleep better than they think they will, partly because they're sleepy from their sleep apnea. Home testing is now done quite frequently. Uh, it is often the preferred modality uh, per insurance recommendations, and that allows you to do the test at home 
but um, it doesn't include the same monitoring as the in-lab study, and, and it can sometimes underestimate sleep apnea if it is on the milder end. So this is the testing and how we get the information. That information is then recorded for breathing effort, for airflow, for oxygen level, for heart rate, and if it's in the lab, to include brainwave activity and measures of sleep. We then get a, a diagnosis or not, and the diagnosis of sleep apnea is when you have at least five times an hour of interrupted breathing. If it's five up to 15 times an hour of the interrupted breathing, the sleep apnea, that's considered mild sleep apnea. Moderate is 15 up to 30, severe is 30 plus, and plus can go to 120 per hour. So treatment. There are behavioral measures, things that we can do to try to help ourselves by having stable sleep routines and healthy lifestyles, including healthy diet, portion control, and exercise. Uh, weight control and avoiding alcohol, sedatives, and pain meds are also things that can help reduce having these apnea events. When it is very symptomatic or severe, Trying those things is part of the plan, but not good enough to really take care of. We need to fix this breathing now. Positive airway pressure or CPAP that many people now have heard about is medically considered a first choice approach because it will keep that air path prop open. This is a motor with a blower and a small mask, sometimes just in what we call a nasal pillows, and sometimes one that's more of a nose and mouth mask. That's very individual. They're not all like this anymore. But the air pressure is delivered to prop that path open. Remember the floppy path, the collapsible path? Now it's going to stay open enough to let the air through, deliver that oxygen, make the breathing quiet because it's moving through properly, and we then can stay asleep through the night because we're breathing. Oral appliances are second line treatments because they don't have quite the same success as the CPAP. Upper airway nerve stimulation, there are a lot of TV commercials for this lately, is just uh, that. It's a nerve stimulator that's implanted on the tongue nerve or the hypoglossal nerve. It is a surgical procedure, which if you've heard the ads, I think they don't always make as close it, as, as clear. It does have a good success rate, 85% uh, success, but again, a surgical procedure. Position modification, some people have most of their events on their backs, trying to keep them off that position can be helpful in certain patients. And then there's the question mark on that slide because there is research being done now on a number of other options, including the potential for medication. Uh, sorry for the pun, but don't hold your breath on that. It's gonna be a little while. So before I end and pass the baton uh, to Dr. Clark, I wanted to bring up a separate situation. This is central sleep apnea. This is a much less common condition, but again, it can be more common in people with heart disease. And uh, the situation here is that the brain signal to take the breath is just not happening on time. And when you don't get the breath signal to take the next breath, your air path is open, but there's no signal to try to draw the air in. And as I mentioned, heart disease can be associated with this. Heart failure, atrial fibrillation are commonly associated with this type of sleep apnea as well. And, uh, and so they can still have obstructive, but they can also have a separate central sleep apnea problem. Uh, stroke, opioids, and then our ever popular, we don't really know why, but the person doesn't take the breaths properly are the other uh, reasons that we see this. For this diagnosis, you need in-lab testing because it requires more sensitivity to the sleep itself and the measurements for the breathing effort or not. Uh, treatment can sometimes be positive airway pressure uh, which often requires a somewhat more sophisticated type of device rather than just the air pressure blowing in. Sometimes supplemental oxygen at night alone can at least help relieve the oxygen decreases. And a newer treatment, which has actually been out now for several years, 
is phrenic nerve stimulation. That's the nerve that, that works to get the diaphragm to move to help us bring the air in. This is a procedure that is done by my cardiology colleagues that goes uh, through the blood vessels instead of there being other cuts and other surgical things, such as we talked about with the other treatment for Inspire. So there are treatments for these conditions. There are reasons to treat these conditions. And we should never be afraid to ask questions if we think something is going on, because there are implications to not treat it. I'm going to pass the baton to Dr. Clark. Okay, thank you. Let me just get my screen up here. Okay, and thank you uh, to the Women's Health Initiative for allowing me to speak tonight. I'm going to uh, carry on with um, from Dr. Goldberg's presentation and talk about sleep apnea and how it specifically affects the heart. Um, I found, you know, that uh, I was, you know, when I go through this, I'm going to talk, you know, about the left heart and the right heart, and just uh, just a quick review here at the start to kind of orient. Um, and we have the uh, blood returning to the heart from the rest of the body into the right atrium. This is the right side of the heart, goes down to the right ventricle, comes out into the pulmonary artery, and then goes to the lungs, where red blood cells receive oxygen again, return to the left side of the heart, and then leave the left side of the heart and go to the rest of the body, delivering oxygen to and nutrients to where they need to go. So if we follow this red blood cell here, it's going to start in the uh, venous system, coming back from the body into the right side of the heart, exit into the pulmonary artery and go to the lungs, pick up new oxygen here, travel back to the left side of the heart, and then out to the body. One continuous circuit there. So sleep disturbances, as, as have been discussed, adversely affect cardiovascular structure and function. It's a bit of a busy slide here, but if we look here, this is kind of flipped over from what I showed you earlier. Effects of um, sleep apnea can cause high pressures uh, on the right side of the heart and can cause the right-sided chambers to dilate. The top chamber, the left side of the heart, can also dilate. And the left ventricle, the main pumping chamber to the body, can thicken with uh, sleep apnea. As Dr. Goldberg said, sleep apnea affects approximately 6% of women, 13% of men. This might be under, underestimated. Um, having sleep apnea triples the chance of having a heart attack, doubles the chance of having an abnormal heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation, increases the incidence of high blood pressure, and increases the chances of having heart failure by about 58%. When we compare women without sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, to women uh, with obstructive sleep apnea, they're more, women that have it are more likely to have another comorbid diagnosis, such as cardiovascular disease, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, asthma, hypothyroidism, joint pain, and reflux or gastritis inflammation of the stomach. Now, some of these things are going to be connected, and, and there's some interplay between sleep apnea, um, and some we don't uh, have a clear link for it yet. So coming to this circle here, uh, in obstructive sleep apnea, Dr. Goldberg talked to you about some of the symptoms that we might find, non-cardiovascular consequences of it. When we come over to this other side, um, we have pathways which cause uh, cardiovascular consequences of sleep apnea. And the first is the, is the sympathetic nervous system. So this is the, the battle between the, the fight or flight system, um, running to catch the bus or running into battle, versus the rest and digest system. And this is uh, normally in a, in a certain balance, which becomes dysregulated uh, when we have sleep apnea. We also know that sleep apnea is an, an inflammatory state. And there's dysfunction of the endothelium. So this is the lining of blood vessels, and uh, this regulates um, dilation or constriction of the blood vessels and also has other regulatory properties uh, in the bloodstream. 
When we think about other um, effects that sleep apnea has uh, causing cardiovascular consequences, we think about metabolic changes. So our, our um, sense, insulin sensitivity or um, need, how much insulin we need for our cells to respond to the sugar that's floating in the blood. Our leptin resistance. So leptin is like a switch for um, you know, telling us when uh, to stop eating, telling us when we're full. So uh, we have increased leptin resistance uh, when we have sleep apnea. We have greater fat turnover or fat breakdown, which sounds like a good thing, but um, greater fat breakdown leads to decreased insulin sensitivity and increased leptin resistance. So um, it's a bit of a cycle here. And then we don't clear cholesterol from the blood as well um, in the setting of obstructive sleep apnea. And the consequences, I'll go into these in a little more detail, uh, increased blood pressure, uh, increased blood pressure between the heart and the lungs, something called pulmonary hypertension abnormal heart rhythms, heart changes like we discussed um, in, in dilation or thickening of heart walls and something, uh, these things can sometimes lead to heart failure, diabetes, abnormal cholesterol, disease of the heart arteries, stroke, and even cardiovascular death. So hypertension or high blood pressure, uh, obstructive sleep apnea is present in about 35% of people with high blood pressure. And among those who are drug resistant, so that they need three or more medicines to control their blood pressure, obstructive sleep apnea is present in about 65 to 80% of them. If the blood pressure doesn't decrease at night, it doesn't decrease at night, a phenomenon that we call uh, somebody that has this as a non-dipper, blood pressure doesn't go down, this does confer uh, a greater long-term cardiovascular risk. And if we treat it, you know, either through medications or treatment of sleep apnea to affect even a small reduction in the sleep time uh, blood pressure, the, the top number, the systolic blood pressure, we can cause a 17% reduction in adverse cardiovascular events. So worthwhile to, you know, to find this, uh, this phenomenon and treat it. Obstructive sleep apnea is present in about 30% of people who have coronary artery disease, disease of the heart arteries. And we don't have a clear line of causation from obstructive sleep apnea to coronary artery disease, but we know some things about it. We know that um, when we have obstructive sleep apnea, it can provoke ischemic changes in the electrocardiogram. So this is uh, changes that are suggested that the, the heart muscle is not getting sufficient blood supply. Um, and if we treat the sleep apnea, um, we can immediately alleviate these changes. Sleep apnea can provoke nocturnal chest pain, and this is probably the same process, not getting enough blood to the heart tissue. It can increase the risk of major adverse cardiac events like stroke or uh, heart attack. And we see fewer events in people with sleep apnea who are treated than people who are not treated. Sleep apnea also increases the risk of restenosis or closure of stents when somebody's had a stent for a heart attack in the past. A couple of quick definitions here. Um, heart failure, um, which I've, I've described, I've said a couple of times now, is, is um, when for some reason the heart's not getting enough blood supply to the rest of the body. This can be a, a weakened heart muscle or a stiffened heart muscle and it's just not able to pump appropriately and get the blood where it needs to go. A subcategory of heart failure is something called pulmonary hypertension. This is high pressure between the heart and the lungs that puts a lot of strain on that right side of the heart and doesn't allow it to, um, to pump properly. So sleep apnea is present in about 53% of patients with heart failure. And here we see that that's made up of um, you know, uh, about 52% central sleep apnea, as Dr. Goldberg had described, and about 48% of obstructive sleep apnea. Untreated sleep apnea in heart failure patients is associated with increased death, increased mortality. And central sleep apnea is present in about 37% of patients with heart failure. When it is present, it's been shown to be a predictor, uh, independent predictor of uh, mortality. And there seems to be this bi-directional relationship in heart failure. So one, one can lead to the other and, and one can make the other worse. So up here we have uh, central sleep apnea and obstructive sleep apnea together. 
they can lead to lower oxygen levels in the blood and um, stress, uh, oxidative stress, inflammation, this imbalance between the fight or flight and the rest and digest system, elevated blood pressures. And all these things can cause or worsen heart failure. Heart failure itself can then lead to something called rostral fluid movement, which is a fancy way of saying that in the daytime, you know, somebody who retains fluid um, in, in a heart failure way, um, that fluid is going to obey gravity uh, and go down to the legs and uh, um, fill the legs in this way, just like the bottle that we see here. But when somebody's sleeping at night and they're lying, lying down in bed, that fluid is going to redistribute. And when it redistributes up into the, um, the muscles uh, that surround the neck, um, then it causes higher tissue pressures there and can cause that airway to obstruct or cause an obstructive sleep apnea. When that fluid redistributes into the lung area, um, that can cause actually a dysregulation in how the lungs and the brain talk to each other, and that can cause a form of central sleep apnea. So we have again this interplay between the two, and this becomes a vicious cycle that kind of keeps uh, going around and around on itself. The severity of obstructive sleep apnea and central sleep apnea in heart failure patients is proportional to that particular person's dietary sodium intake, so likely as a consequence of salt and water retention. We do see abnormal heart rhythms in, in sleep apnea. The most common that we see is bradycardia or slow heart rates, and this can be seen in up to 95% of people with obstructive sleep apnea. We see other slow heart rhythms, uh, bradyarrhythmias or slowing of the heart rate due to some kind of interference with the heart's conduction system. And that's present in about 18% of people with obstructive sleep apnea. When we see increased severity of sleep apnea as measured by the apneic hypopneic index, we see increased occurrence of these slow heart rates. We also see ventricular arrhythmias. So these are abnormal heartbeats or heart rhythms that come from the bottom chambers of the heart. And these can sometimes be more hostile. We see this in up to 74% of people with obstructive sleep apnea, whereas if we just look at a normal population, we see it in about 5%. And it's usually observed overnight at the end of an apneic episode. Abnormal heart rhythms occurring with sleep apnea are reduced when we treat the sleep apnea. And finally, um, the cardiovascular event of stroke. We do see a higher stroke risk uh, with a worse degree of obstructive sleep apnea. And among those who have had a stroke, about 60% have obstructive sleep apnea and about 12% have central sleep apnea. Treating the obstructive sleep apnea following a stroke can help with recovery, especially if it's in the very early period um, where it's discovered and treated uh, after somebody has a stroke. Just bring you back to this uh, busy slide from the beginning showing all these different changes, the dilation of the right heart, the dilation of the top chamber of the left, the thickening of the heart walls and the effects that we have uh, in treating. So these are, uh, this, this slide is made up of many small studies. We've never had you know, giant studies that have shown this, but we have many small studies that have shown kind of one or two of these things. So when we uh, have sleep apnea, we know that the uh, LV um, uh, mass is going to increase. Treating it will make it decrease. Our systolic function or our heart squeeze and our heart relaxation are going to worsen in the setting of obstructive sleep apnea and do improve when we treat it. The size of the different chambers uh, worse enlarges or dilates um, with obstructive sleep apnea and improves uh, when we treat it. And finally, the pulmonary pressure, the pressure between the heart and the lungs, worsens with sleep apnea and improves when we treat it. So thank you everyone for your attention today. I think we uh, will pass it back to uh, Dr. Hernandez and Heather uh, for a question and answer period. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Goldberg and Dr. Clark uh, for these uh, really interesting and great presentations. Um, we asked the audience to submit questions ahead of time and we had a lot of good questions and now we're going to answer some of the questions that were submitted. Uh, the first question is for Dr. Goldberg. If you are not diagnosed with sleep apnea, but only breathe heavily intermittently when you're sick or exhausted, does that can also affect the heart health? That the importance is to make sure that 
these symptoms of breathing heavily, and that may happen more when a person is ill, you're congested, uh, you'll feel more exhausted in general. It's, it's important to make sure that those can't also be symptoms of sleep apnea relating to breathing. As I mentioned earlier, the symptoms are not always obvious to the person. So uh, if you do have just bad allergies or other, other reasons for head congestion, chronic sinus problems, things of that nature, they don't tend to have the same impact on the breathing during sleep. They don't, they don't make the person have other of the changes we talked about with the implications of not being able to get the air through or not taking the breath. So the direct connection with um, other health risks, I think, is less clear. And especially because many of these things are intermittent symptoms. You know, we have a bad cold, you get over it, you go back to normal. The difference with sleep apnea is that there's no break in the action. If you have sleep apnea when you're sleeping, you have those same negative experiences happening every night and all night. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Clark, for those patients that are, I, uh, have heart failure or are fluid overloaded, could CPAP in the future be a treatment option uh, to improve their heart function? So we, we do see minor improvements in heart function or heart squeeze, what's known as the ejection fraction when we, when we treat sleep apnea. It's probably not the whole story here. Um, you know, when, when somebody has heart failure, you know, we do want to try to get to the bottom of, of what's causing it. We do, in some cases, have specialized medicines that can prolong life and keep people out of the hospital. And we, should, uh, we do need to focus our efforts there as well as decongesting somebody and getting all the extra fluid that they have out. Um, that, in turn, can help with the sleep apnea on its own, plus the treatment on top of it can help really keep the balance and keep that extra fluid off and keep somebody feeling well when they have sleep apnea and heart failure. Um, what, uh, Dr. Goldberg, I, we have a question. Um, I have an old CPAP that has not been used for a year. Is it okay just to use the same one again or you need to get a new one, be reevaluated? Yeah, it depends on how old that uh, old CPAP is. Certainly, if you have a machine that hasn't been used for a year, regardless of age, it depends on where it's been living in that time. Has it been in its case? Has it been in a protected bag? Uh, or is it just sitting on a shelf in the basement gathering dust and many other unpleasant things? So your concern about the cleanliness of the device is an important one, and uh, would certainly suggest that uh, you have the device checked out by the equipment company that may have provided this to begin with to make sure that it is safe to use. You know, common sense would of course say you clean it off, you wipe it off, uh, you make sure that the supplies are not a year old because they won't work well uh, having sat around. So it's the blower itself you wanna make sure is functioning right, but make sure that the supplies are updated if this is an old machine, uh, for uh, depending on which insurance uh, is, is relevant here, Medicare will say that you are usually allowed to get a new machine at five years as part of a built-in obsolescence. Uh, so if the machine is that old, it is possibly better, especially if it's been on the shelf, to just uh, follow up with your, with your doctor. You know, you want to get back in touch with your sleep doctor if they haven't been involved in a year and, uh, and make sure that uh, the right studies are made or the, just the order made for you to get an updated device and to make sure that it's followed after that when you're motivated again. And I'm pleased for you uh, to get this going and uh, get back on treatment. Never bad to start again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dr. Clark, can wearing a heart monitor detect sleep apnea? Yeah, so um, I, in interpreting the question, um, I guess we could go kind of a couple directions with this, you know, um, and the, the first, uh, I think that the big, 
the big um, uh, kind of message would be that I think they could increase our suspicion that sleep apnea may be present and that we should look for it, but none of these devices would necessarily be diagnostic for sleep apnea. Um, if we take something like a Holter monitor or an ambulatory monitor, like a physician may prescribe that you wear for uh, one day, two days, a week, et cetera, um, then we might have a really strong you know, feeling based on you know, maybe some heart rate slowing or some bradyarrhythmias, um, some different you know, conduction troubles with the heart overnight, different abnormal heart beats uh, from the bottom chambers of the heart, ventricular beats and this sort of thing might lend a strong suspicion that you know, sleep apnea may be present and that um, the person may need to be screened for it. If we take something like an Apple Watch or you know, one of the newer devices that somebody uses uh, to, to um, you know, track their heart rate at uh, rest and, uh, and while exerting themselves, um, these, these monitors can also track sleep. It, it's a little bit harder to say, uh, we might have you know, a signal or a flag that might get raised that say, hey, this needs to be looked into a little bit further and maybe we need to look for sleep apnea here, um, but maybe less so than that Holter monitor or ambulatory monitor from a physician's office. Um, the signs you may see, see there is maybe very slow heart rate seen overnight. Um, you know, a normal resting heart rate would be in the 50 to 60 beat per minute range for, um, for you know, an average healthy adult. You know, if it's dropping, you know, kind of on the low end of that or even below that, that might be a suspicion. Um, or if irregular heartbeats or atrial fibrillations, as could be picked up by uh, an Apple Watch, that might also uh, lend a suspicion there. So not exactly diagnostic, but they, should, they could and should raise some flags that uh, we should be looking for, for sleep apnea. Dr. Clark, where we're on the topic of heart rhythms, could you expand a more uh, about atrial fibrillation and sleep apnea and the need to look for sleep apnea in people who have atrial fibrillation? Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, in, in atrial fibrillation, you know, there's um, this is a, a chaotic rhythm in the in the top chambers of the heart um, that can cause very fast heartbeats, and we do have a very close association with atrial fibrillation and sleep apnea. So, um, you know, in somebody with atrial fib or a, uh, AFib, um, we should be looking for um, sleep apnea. Yeah, uh, Dr. Uh, Goldberg, uh, one of the members of the audience had this question. I hate having to take my CPAP if I'm going away for one night. Is it okay to skip CPAP? The simple medical answer is of course not. Mm -hmm. And then there's reality. <laughs> so uh, there is some literature that does suggest that even a single night without your machine can increase your risk from these respiratory events. Um, there's not really any good literature that says one night away is okay, three nights is bad. Um, I, would, I would ask what is the limiting factor in taking it with you, obviously, different travel situations, different access to electrical outlets. Um, there are a number of people who have looked into travel units because they are smaller uh, and usually much easier to take with you on any kind of trip. Uh, the problem is that medical insurance does not consider them medically necessary because they already paid for one type of unit and, um, and it, the self-pay is not a small amount. Uh, if you also know that when you skip CPAP for a night, you feel awful the next day and everybody who shared a hotel room with you is mad at you, I would suggest that it's probably better to take it along and maybe somebody else can carry it. If you know that your apnea is milder and again, you're basically healthy otherwise, and you say one night, I don't think it'll be a problem, then you're probably right. But do give it some thought to what are the implications as opposed to just, oh, it's another thing to carry along. Okay. And I have a question for Dr. Goldberg. Could you expand a little more on relationship uh, menopause uh, and sleep apnea and if any effects on the heart health if it's uh, more common after menopause, and what are is there any more significant heart health effect after menopause? Sure. 
Yes, so we know that um, women do have a substantial increase in the risk for sleep apnea in the perimenopause. So as your periods are starting to get more irregular and, uh, and once you're in menopause with the official definitions that are used there. Uh, and some of the reasons for this can be associated with weight gain that many women experience with menopause, but you do not have to gain weight with menopause for you to have increased apnea risk because much of that is also determined by a number of hormonal changes that, uh, that the person goes through. So we shift from, I'll call them more protective breathing, breathing favoring hormones like estrogen and progesterone, which is what we have through most of our, uh, of our years before menopause to a lower level of these and more of a um, male, not fully obviously, but male uh, contingents of hormones, which are less airway protective. In fact, um, just as a sidebar, a testosterone supplement for, for a man who has low testosterone has been shown to potentially increase sleep apnea in that person. So if a woman is going through menopause and having a shift in those hormones, that does seem to increase the risk for sleep apnea. Uh, the implications for health are uh, similar in that anyone with significant sleep apnea does have these cardiovascular risks, but I think that you also have to weigh increasing risks for those things as a comorbid condition, not just as an outgrowth of sleep apnea. So uh, I, you know, I always encourage women to have conversations with their gynecologists who sometimes are still their only provider uh, to get these questions addressed. Uh, we all know that many people can sleep less well because of the, the what we call the vasomotor reactions, which is commonly what you'll talk about with night sweats or, um, or hot flashes. And I'll bring back that anything that disturbs sleep, even if it, if it is not apnea, does have some implications for increased cardiovascular risk to, to increase heart health risks. So you don't even have to have apnea, but if your sleep is disturbed, this is also something that's important to discuss with your provider. What, why is it disturbed? Treat the reason it's disturbed, but be aware that it's not healthy to not sleep well. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg and Dr. Clark. Um, for answering all these questions. Um, if you also, if you have any questions about your heart health or about more of our Women's Heart virtual webinars, or if you want more information about our, our Women's Heart Initiative educational programs or any question that anything we can help you, uh, we are available by email, mlhwomensheart at mlhs.org. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight, and have a wonderful evening.